Hello, my name is Betsy Miller Kush. I'm the gallery director here at the Somarts Gallery, this in the, located in the South of Market Cultural Center in the South of Market District of San Francisco. We are currently holding a wonderful exhibition, The Re-Show, which is a reunion show of artists from the 1960s and 1970s. Beginning in 1960, we followed on the heels of the, the Beat Generation, which was centered in North Beach. We overlapped the psychedelic, hippie, summer of love generation, which came in the 1970s. So our show is an exuberant look at almost every artistic development during that time period. We have about 80 artists in the show of every style, every persuasion, and some of them are here with us today for our conversation with the artists. I'd like to begin by introducing our co-curators of the show, three men who have worked terribly hard to contact the artists from that time period and cajole them into being in, in this exhibition with us. I'll start with John Behanna, who was the director at the... Uh, <laughs> at Camera Works, John Fr Jack Freeman, who is uh, quite a man about town in every way, largely right. responsible for finding, uh, digging in corners and finding some of these artists. Yeah. Brian McPartland, who came in the 1970s, so he missed the early part of the, of the, uh, the time period, but Nancy Frank, was here for the, the very early days and has quite colorful memories of that time. Yes, and then I Flicka do. McGurin was another artist who's, who overlapped, I believe, the entire time period and has continued uh, to make a name for herself here in San Francisco. So here we all are remembering a time when Soma was warehouses, railroads, old uh, uh, torn up buildings, uh, run down SRO hotels. Um, it was called the South of the Slot in those days, referring to the slot where the cable cars pass on Mission Street. And it was a cheap, dirty, uh, neglected part of town, and therefore full of artists. So I'd like <laughs> Brian to, to begin maybe by telling us a little bit about what it was like when he arrived here uh, early in the 70s. I remember mainly how unionized everything was and how inexpensive it was in the South of Market. Uh, old uh, uh, hotels along 3rd and 4th uh, and Mission, a lot of retired uh, seamen and uh, just inexpensive restaurants, great uh, lofts. You could rent a whole loft for a hundred bucks and wow. just great, yes. great place to be. Nancy, you were here even a little bit earlier. Well, no, actually, I came in 1972. All right. And uh, I was an art student and graduated from the San Francisco Art Institute. And it just hit me that this show today that's called RE stands for Reunion. That's I didn't right. get that. That's before. right. Yeah. So well, I love that. This is yeah. really, it is a, re a reunion because. Uh, Times have really changed, uh, as we all know, south of markets turned into condos and so on. But yeah, uh, I can only say those were the good old days, really. I uh, just have really incredible fond memories. Um, I was the um, associate director of Lama Mel and Artcom. We housed a 10,000 square foot uh, gallery. And <clears throat> I mean, we came in at a nickel a square foot. We could have well, John B. Hanna was really a, a, an active real estate agent and was really helpful in helping artists uh, live out their dream and get us down here in South of Market. And I can remember um, with Carl Leffler looking at all kinds of lofts. There were just so many to choose from. Um, I mean, you could go pick and choose what type of space, what kind of light, how large, how small. I mean, there was just so much space available and really nobody wanted to live down here so it was, it was mostly it was cheap it I was mean, that was the big thing it was cheap it, five yeah. cents a foot five cents a square foot <laughs> and uh we had a 20-year lease and was um, that 70 12th street yep 70 12th street we wanted to be close to the museum of modern art which at that time was on vanessa McAllister. So we thought, you know, positioning ourselves near, near the museum was a, a good place to be. 
And um, yeah, we had the whole third floor of this old industrial wooden brick building with a big freight elevator that artists actually used the elevator and the inside and the outside of the building. We were um, very much involved in uh, performance art, conceptual art, publishing, and uh, kind of really documenting that activity in, in not only in the Bay Area, but all of California. Jack, when you arrived uh, in the 1960s, right? Uh, well, and, and, and you were speaking earlier about a little bit about the, the lonely sound of the railroads going through the, the trains. Oh, uh, that was uh, after, that was about 1970. And uh, I'd gotten out of the Art Institute, and I have the studio now that I had then. Hmm. And um, I lived there for a little while. But what I remember that is the most dramatic change between then and now is that the city had a pulse. In the morning, the, the uh, canoe traffic would start, and it wasn't as aggressive as it is now. And about 8.30 and 9 o'clock it would stop, there would be a little silence, and then the truck, delivery trucks would, would uh, apply their trade around the south of market until about 11.30, and they would stop for lunch. And you hear a few cars, and at 1 o'clock the trucks would start back until about 4, then they would stop. 5 o'clock traffic would, would, would pick up, then it would be quiet again, and then the trains would come in delivering sheet metal or whatever to the uh, machine shops around and it was it was like it was alive there was this this sense of something and now it's it's just sort of an aggressive uh, time of, uh, of, of non-stop motion and uh, you know nightclubs are going all night and something's going on all day and it's a totally different, noisy, and more insensitive uh, place. Well, speaking of life, uh, Brian, would you uh, repeat the story that you were telling us a little bit earlier about the, about the truck? The union strike. The union strike, yeah, yes, I was, I was because driving, it was a, a union. I had my baby in the back seat. She was in a car seat. And coming down to my studio at Bloxham Street, and uh, it was in the middle of the day, and I, there were these truckers on strike, and one of them was standing on the corner, and he waved, and he said, get away from here, get away from here. I slowed down, and I, I was curious. I watched in trucks blocked off, I think it was Townsend Street, it may have been Brandon, they blocked the street off at either end, and there were a thousand union truckers there. Uh, there were there were pickup trucks with filled with beer. The, the, the backs of the trucks were like giant coolers, and guys just drinking, and they blocked the street off so the police couldn't come in, and they burned down a trucking company right to the ground in broad daylight with the police watching from the other side. Incredible. That's how strong the unions were here. Yeah. And it was, it was a union area. Well, San Francisco has always been a very union town. Go way back to the... Uh, they could get Thursday. violent, too. I remember I had a studio over uh, near where uh, Albera Jeep is, and I was painting about 10 o'clock one night, and I heard what I knew was a, was a shotgun blast about a block away, and the next morning in the paper, Dow Wilson, who was the head of the local painters union, had been blasted away as he walked out of the meeting hall. Mm -hmm. Uh, about 16th and South Van Ness. I, I knew his, I knew his ex-wife. You did? Yeah, and her, her niece. Yeah. Incredible. Right on the street. Yep. Yeah. Well, artists never really amazing. got organized enough to get unionized. Um, there was no unions for artists. They well, shouldn't I be. Wonder, that's a that's a good point because I think that the fact that you tried to locate near the museum, uh, the the formal art community of San Francisco never supported us artists and right. we were very in tune with that so we had that wonderful uh, neighborhood arts uh, civic center art um, yearly art, art show yeah. that was fabulous and 
Um, we all kept studios and kept working in what I think the Art Institute, all, most of our connections to the San Francisco Art Institute, um, makes for a somewhat unique uh, um, trend in art that we all embrace and it is reflected in the art in this show. And it's and it's, uh, it's a part of what we have in common, which I think is, is very exciting, is that our art is unique and it, it holds together because it does not uh, really belong to that, uh, to that formal um, art expression, that, that um, museum uh, exposure. We just haven't really had it and our art is great. Flicka, would you like to say something about your piece that's in the show? Uh, because it certainly exemplifies what, exactly what you're talking about. Well, thank you. Uh, this piece is actually a piece I was glad to realize that this is a piece that I'd done down at my Pier 70 studio. And I had that Pier 70 studio for a good 20 years. And um, this was a piece that I had done over a long period of time and then finished it up in my new studio, which is over in the Fisherman's Wharf North Beach area. Oh. And it's uh, a piece that is bold painting, you know, indicative of the, the California art teachers at the Art Institute, bold and uh, clear and simple and nonspecific. And I think that that's the kind of thing that we all embrace in San Francisco. It's, it's unique and it's, I'm glad we're having this panel. It gives us some, some sense of continuity here. Mm -hmm. Where was that studio, Pier 70? The Noonan Building. Oh, oh, that's, yeah, that's way that's around And that's still there. in existence. Yeah, I still have yes. the space there, but it's, it, I'm, sub I'm subletting that one because I have a great space. Al Ring was in there. Yeah, Al Ring was, uh, let's see, where was he? He was um, upstairs floor. from me, yeah. third floor. Yeah. I thought you were in the, uh, the Hunter's Point. Nope. Never. Mm -mm. I swear I saw Pier you. 70. John, yeah. there's a wonderful photo of you in the show. I forget the name of the artist, but you're, sta you're standing there with a pipe, and it's a, a kind of a shadowy background, almost looks like the Industrial Re Revolution yeah. uh, unfolding behind you. I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like when you arrived and how you saw that, that time period develop in terms well, of I arrived the, here in 58, but I didn't come back I, I had to go to work for a while so I put in my, oh. fif <laughs> my 15 years and retired early in 75 and the photo that and, we're looking but at the on photo this up there was I had bought this plastic stretch suit that engineers wore I'm an engineer I bought this plastic stretch suit to go to a convention to get a job and Charlie Franklin who started camera work he was so and happy about it, he took me up on the roof and gave me a few props, and it shot on the roof at 63 blocks. And, but I did yeah. get a job. We started, just I did, to interrupt, Fiehenna, Charlie me. Franklin did not start camera work. Let's get the history straight, okay? I was there. Okay, who's, who's so was I. It? it was John... John Lampkin. Patrick Lampkin started it originally. Thank and you. It, Let's give Charlie credit where over. credit is due. Right. Case made. John <laughs> Lampkin started camera work. And then how did, did Bluxem Street Patrick come into, Very the, good. into the picture? I'm glad I'm a <laughs> painter. <laughs> how, did how did it come into the, because I but think of John as part of Bluxem <laughs> Street rather than <laughs> camera work, but then I don't know the well, history the way that you do. Well, we were all about the same time, Lama Mel, camera work, Bluxem Street, uh, other alternative gallery spaces we all came about uh, but that was in the 70s that was in the early 70s and it was a, as a result of a, a, just a great number of artists coming out of the Art Institute and Flicka kind of uh, mentioned this earlier about the the continuity of the artists that came out of the Art Institute we we didn't really fit into the downtown galleries this group of South Market artists and so we started looking for our own venue. And we, you know, the, with the accessibility of inexpensive spaces and uh, really more uh, newness of mass media and self-promotion, we were able to uh, put on our own exhibitions. We really just, we, the downtown galleries, we didn't need them. 
we, we, well, we I think decided we, to get famous on our own. Uh, absolutely. And, <laughs> and we didn't. <laughs> we didn't. Hey, I'm rich in spirit, <laughs> man. Are you kidding? Yeah, you but many of the artists at that time wouldn't conform to a, like a slick look. They, and that also was bred at the Art Institute, the, this kind of um, do everything for your, for your own, uh, do it your own way. And wow. down on Grand Avenue at the time, things were really, if you didn't have, if your canvas wasn't perfectly square and it didn't have the right frame, they wouldn't even look at your work. And so we, you know, we couldn't afford that uh, kind of presentation and we, we did it ourselves. That's how Bluxom Street really started. Well, we didn't want to compromise ourselves. That's the That's thing that I love thing, about yeah. the Art Institute. I grew up in San Francisco, and the San Francisco Art Institute meant the world to me. And um, it took me a long time to get there, but I finally did. And they couldn't get me to leave. I, I just dragged out my courses, and I stayed there as long as possible because I just think that art from the Art Institute, art Institute you can almost identify it. In a, in a room full of art, you could almost identify the Art Institute people. Well, uh, a absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think what uh, you're sa you said this very quickly, and that we were an, an alternative art space. And I think that's something that we really need to focus on here, because that's really what we were called, uh, these alternative mm -hmm. art spaces. And what were we an alternative to? the museums and the institutions and the galleries and for, for me personally uh, I am an alumni from the Art Institute but I, I found that the Art Institute was producing incredibly romantic painterly uh, romantic kind of art and continued to embellish that romantic myth and so for at least us at La Mamelle, Carl Leffler and I felt that we were an alternative to the museums and the, and the galleries because we chose not to show painting in our gallery. We found that there were way too many places to show paintings. And so we had a beautiful 10,000 square foot white walled natural lit space that any painter would just drool at when they walked in. But we never showed a painting at La Mamelle at Artcom. So that's and why you never told me about that the whole time we were drinking coffee at the Summer Cafe for years? <laughs> hey, you were, exactly. I was into video and, and, you know, moving images and you guys were still painting. You know, I had moved on. I was working um, hard. I mean, there are a group of painters here who yeah, don't so feel that, well, <laughs> that it's And to be <laughs> honest with you, when we talk about this show, I, uh, my big surprise was is just how much two-dimensional painting there was, is, in this show. Well, well, still, still is. is. Curated by two-dimensional painters. Well, I'm just and saying, you know, when we talk the about time. the 70s, we really have to remember that this was an incredible time. This was way before MTV. This was, there was video art. I mean, not only did the Art Institute have a very romantic, painterly presence in the city, but there was so much alternative um, video art. There was Ant Farm, T.R. Uthko. I mean, really important major artists that were doing uh, video really early on. And of course, the museums were not interested in any kind of uh, moving images and didn't have technology and didn't feel that this was a place, and, you know, of course now we have the Museum of Modern Art, we have Yerba Buena Gardens, we have media curators and media and video and moving images and installations and sound and so on, obviously is a valid art form. And it was all of us that created this alternative thinking and wouldn't let this kind of uh, media go away. Um, but it's interesting also that the, that the institutions that you've just mentioned are in the south of Market area. They're in exactly the place where all of this this flourished originally. And sure. there were, and and how did they come to be here? We'll explore that in some of the later programs. Uh, jo uh, Jack has a lot to say about redevelopment, and so does John. The fact <laughs> that the that the Don't artists could can no longer <laughs> afford to live here. And and John, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that time period in terms of the the change in real estate. The fact that that artists who could afford to live here were in a sense driven out from from at least from the artist's viewpoint. Well, mm -hmm. The first place the artists lived was 
was North Beach and down the hill into the produce district. And pretty soon it got a little gentrified and fancy coffee shops got, came in and, and uh, furniture stores. And lo and behold, then the urban removal people came in, knocked down a bunch of buildings, places like the Ice House, and they built another place right in place of it, and they called it the Ice House. Yeah. So after a while, it just got gentrified. And fortunately, the, the containerization came in. So all the bulk shipping storage lofts and, and warehouses south of market were empty. I mean, it was in the early 70s, they were all empty. We got our place for five cents a foot. And uh, so the artists moved from after they'd been gentrified out of North Beach, they moved to, to South of Market, where we were all set for about 10 years, 15 years, and the, re, the, the city rezoning of 1981 this wonderful thing where they came up with this business about art, live work spaces. And the live work space was, any, was about a combination of residential and commercial codes. Zoning. But they also Zoning. cut yeah. back on the taxes that you had to pay and the amenities for an apartment building. So this was for the artists. The artists couldn't afford to build up their places to meet the code. On top of which, they said they set up all the, the the industrial spaces could be a provisional residential. So that went on, and and uh, the next thing they did, the rent control people said if an artist was living in an industrial building, it was de facto residential and rent controlled. So everybody threw all the artists out of the loft, so they didn't get their building rent controlled, and. Uh, 20 years later, somebody found the, the, the original code was for existing buildings. And somebody struck out existing just before the Board of Supervisors uh, <laughs> voted for it. Nobody can tell me who, who did it. It wasn't Joe Donahue. It, 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 it was done. In, no, it wasn't. It was done innocently. So 20 years later, Joe Donahue sees this thing. It says, no, no taxes, no amenities this whole code and on top of which you can knock down any industrial building and put a residential one in place. So in 1981 or 1984, everybody had had these, these warehouse buildings were out. And John, we, we met the to, enemy. to wrap this okay. segment up, but I thank you greatly for your uh, <laughs> insight. I, you, I just want to say one thing about the Art Institute and talking about live workspaces. Because for me, as a, as a young artist in, in the 70s, the attraction of the Art Institute was that it was open 24 hours. Yes. And the Academy of Art, you know, was just a little small school on Sutter Street, and they would lock up their doors at 6 o'clock and kick everybody out. But the Art Institute went all night long. And every day. Every day, 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And it was like that became the model for live workspaces because we wanted to live and work after we had that 24 hour access experience. That's At a least. Great observation. It's yeah, true. I mean, it really did instill that in yeah. us, didn't it? We do, I do. I need remember to wrap painting this, there on Christmas. This segment oh, up, yeah. however, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, we thank you for joining us today for this this uh, segment of our program. We will be returning to speak further about the artists, the organizations, the alternative spaces, the groups, all of the, the, the ferment that the came out richness. of this part of the city. Yes, the richness. We hope you'll join us. I'd like to thank Flicka, Nancy, Brian, Jack, and John for their contributions today, and we will see you again. Thank you. Thank you for the show. Good. Okay, I'm and that's now we're my, supposed to just that's keep my on talking. Okay, we're supposed yeah. to just keep they roll I want to talk. I want to tell yeah, me more so, about why you wouldn't give me a show over there. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, we want to.